Yes, sir. We're right back at you one more time. An outstanding episode. All things covered. Patrick Peterson and Brian McFadden. Man, we got another entertaining, informative show for you guys, our listeners and our viewers. Shots out for all of you guys for supporting us. We, we're so thankful. Make sure you hit us in our comment section as well. And always, as we oftentimes tell you guys, tell a friend to tell a friend about what we're doing here at All Things Covered. Man, this is for you football fanatics out there. This is the show for you, for you guys that love quality, stout, physical, defensive plays. This is the show for you, for you historians of the game of football. This is the episode for you. Our guest, I'm so fired up. I haven't seen my guy in such a long time. It's such a pleasure to have the great, the legend, the living legend, Dick LeBeau is joining us for this episode. Pro Football Hall of Famer as a player. He also could go in as a coach, but they were able to give him that opportunity to enter football heaven, as I like to say, as a player, two-time Super Bowl champion as a coach. Yes, we won two of them things together. With him being a coach, me being a player, spent part of seven decades. Think about this. Seven decades within the NFL as a player or as a coach. Clearly, the experience is there. An all-time great around high character guy. No other than Coach LeBeau joining us here. Coach, how you doing? How you feeling? Well, that's a great introduction there, my good friend. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling great. Uh I can't tell you how great it is uh, to see and talk to you, B Mac. The only problem with uh, getting a little bit older and, and retiring and moving away, man, people that you love, you don't get to see them near as often. I like it better when it was every day I see my guys, man. But it's good to see you, and I'm, I'm so proud of you uh, for your success. And uh, I, I know it's going to be, get bigger and bigger, pal. I appreciate that, Coach, man. There's so much we want to tap into with you. And we're going to get into some of the epic stories on the football field. But first, we want to hear your best story on the golf course. We know you're a big-time golfer. We want to hear your best story on the golf course with someone from the NFL world, like someone you participated with on the golf course that's from the NFL world, someone either you beat up on on the golf course or you guys go back and forth quite a few uh, but, you know, what kind of entertaining golf stories you have for us in regards to participating with someone from the NFL world? Oh, golf is not my game. I just that's my pastime. But <laughs> it, it, along with football, it's a great love of mine. Yep. And uh, I've had the honor to play with uh, uh, Jack Nicholas and Tom Weisskopf in college. We were all at a high state relatively the same time. And. Uh, Later on, going uh, to Pittsburgh for 16 years, uh, we were only an hour away from the Trobe, as you know, and that's the home of Arnold Palmer. Mm -hmm. And I got to play golf with him a few times. And I know those are not guys from the NFL, but uh, those, those are no noteworthy names, Coach. Yeah, noteworthy those are names. memories that, that I'll never forget. And they all really emphasize, I should say that I really concentrated on football because golf was the way those guys played. It was not going to be my game. Uh, I had, uh, we had a good uh, NFL player, John Brody, uh, back in my day that played uh, a little bit on the tour. Uh, they sent him packing, but he, he did actually win, I think, a senior tour a tournament. He was an excellent player. So in terms of, uh, Tying in the NFL with uh, with golf, uh, he's as close as thing to, to top quality golfers to, from the NFL. Uh, and I, yours truly, did win the NFL golf championship one year. The <laughs> tournament. <laughs> <laughs> so it's safe to say you know your way around the course. Yeah, well, I was used to chasing the uh, uh, wide receivers around, so chasing the golf ball fit right in there pretty Yes, pretty sir. Good. Yes, sir. And, and, and talking about chasing wide receivers, man, for our listeners and our viewers that don't know a lot about Coach LeBeau, uh, you know, he before he became a big-time pro in the NFL, he started off at Ohio State. Right. Uh, let's sure. go back to 1957, Coach. You're playing both sides of the football field, right? You're on offense and defense, scoring two touchdowns for Ohio State to come back and beat Michigan, right? We know what type of rivalry that is now, but fill us in on how 
that rivalry was back then when you were a Buckeye? It was it was a much larger thing. I don't know exactly uh, the two states abut each other, and I think it, it originated in a, a semi border dispute or something of that nature. But uh, the the competition between Ohio and Michigan was even uh, much more extreme back then. Uh, you know, the way that the game has become a, a more universal uh, procedure in, in news of football goes around. Uh, I think things, uh, neighborhood spats, if you will, have diminished somewhat, but they're still very, very important. Uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, you know, you're not going to tell those people it don't matter anymore either. But <laughs> uh, Ohio State and Michigan was uh, – Oh man, it was it was sincerely genuine. Uh, I think more so back in the in the fifties. Uh, whoo, that's a hard number for me to say, but uh, we uh, we had a, a pretty uh, enthusiastic coach. His name was Woody Hayes. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he's somewhat well known even to this day, and Woody would continually come up with ways to keep Michigan in our mind. Uh, And for a couple of years, we had a big, huge mat uh, in front of our locker room. When we every day that we came in off the practice field, particularly if it had been an inclement weather day, we would just ride in any stains of whatever we had on our shoes off on the Michigan mat, man. Of course, that's what we (laughs) intended to do to them. It's the last game of the year. It's always been the last game of the year. Yep. And, uh, one thing about great rivalries, the score, uh, the season record, the, the 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 two teams have compiled going into that game, you could throw that right out the window. I mean, it didn't matter whether one team had it really, sincerely, an undefeated record and the other one had hardly won, you know, a third of its games. That game was going to be a one touchdown, a one field goal game because everybody was playing with everything inside of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we managed to win. Well, this, to this day, is still a, a tradition. If you beat Michigan, you get a pair of gold pants, a, a charm. And uh, I, got, oh, really? I got three of them. I got three of them to put on my mama's charm brace, bracelet. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that was a thing when Ohio State beats Michigan. Yeah. I didn't. So are, was, are, are they oh, still doing it to this day? I, you know, that's a good question. I think they do, but maybe not. Uh, okay. It was it was an absolute objective, a main objective of all the high state players was to get that uh, goal pass. One story about uh, Ohio State, Michigan. Uh, we also had uh, your senior year. They had a uh, what they called a senior tackle, and every senior on the squad, the, the whole squad lined up and formed a, an a alley, and. Uh, Every senior got to come down and hit their Ray Crowther tackling machine one more time. This was uh, symbolic of their last tackle that they're ever going to make for a high state on a practice field. And we uh, made, we did it always the, the day, the Friday, before the Saturday Ohio State football game. Well, you can imagine the guys got pretty cranked up for it and uh, – one of our starting linemen separated his shoulder hitting the machine <laughs> because he hit it so hard. So Woody quickly said, I see the end of the ceremonial uh, senior tackle. He said, from here on in, we're just going to walk down between the two guys and grab the tackle of the machine. <laughs> so we ended the senior tackle, but it was it – was, uh, everything revolved around the Ohio State-Michigan day, uh, game in my day. It was always, I think, a bigger deal even yesterday than today in that rivalry. Uh, as we uh, we have a song that we sing in Ohio, uh, we don't give a damn about the whole state of Michigan. <laughs> and that's still <laughs> very popular. Oh, man, that's great. That's one thing I love about college football, some of the, the long-lasting rivalries that have been started back, back in time and now still relevant to this day. And we know how intense that rivalry is currently still with Ohio State and Michigan. And you said you beat Michigan, what, three times, Coach, you said? Uh, three out of the four. Yeah, Three out of the four. That's a great, that's a nice winning percentage right Yeah, and uh, 
your freshman year, you weren't eligible to play because uh-huh. that was why we were playing single platoon ball then. NCAA <laughs> had rules. The freshman couldn't play, so we yeah. probably would have won all four. <laughs> and, and, and Coach, after you became a star in Columbus, you en- entered the NFL. Uh, an opportunity to play with the Detroit Lions. Of course, currently for our listeners and our viewers who might not know a little bit about Coach LeBeau as a, as a defender, as a player, one heck of a ball hawk. Uh, currently, 62 interceptions. That's 10th in the National Football League. Uh, you're the all-time record holder with intercep- in interceptions for the Detroit Lions. But while you was in Detroit playing, you also played in the same secondary, secondary with some other legendary names. Lim Barney, Dick Knight Train Lane. Tell us about that experience, Coach, you know, being a part of such a prolific secondary unit while you was there with the Lions. Yeah, and there was a uh, Yale Larry was in there too. Uh, yeah, and, and all four of those guys are in the Hall of Fame now. All four. Uh, I don't know if there's another secondary. We got to do our research, but off the top of my head, yeah. I don't know if there's another secondary that had four guys get into the hall. Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I don't think there is. Uh, we didn't exactly all four play in the exact same backfield at the same time. Night Train and I were the corners, uh, and Gary uh, Lowe and uh, Yale Larry uh, were the safeties in, in the early 60s. And yep. they called us the four L's. And the four L's. We were, we were a fearsome force of men. Uh, the, the quarterbacks feared Night Train. You know, the, wherever he was, they were not even going to look over his way. So that's how I learned to play because they said, well, Night Train's over here. That means LeBeau got to be over here. Said, between the rookie <laughs> and, and Night Train, we going after LeBeau. So I uh, had to either learn how to play or go home, man. So, uh, yeah. So when Night Train uh, was with us about five or six years from maybe 60 one to 65, maybe six, somewhere in there. And then uh, a year after that he retired, uh, uh, we drafted Lim, and Lim mm-hmm. came in. And Lim himself uh, went into the Hall of Fame, both of them. And Yale, Yale had his uh, playing career uh, interrupted by a, a term in the service. Mm-hmm. And uh, he came back. I caught him at the end of his career and uh, my rookie year. So we did have Yale training myself on the field at the same time, three Hall of Famers. And mm. then Lim jumped in there pretty quick. So we spanned uh, that that era. And uh, I don't think there's another team come close to that, all four of us in the, in the no. Hall of Fame. Yeah. And Lim Barney, he's number 18 he's ranked the 18th player in the national football league with 56 interceptions night train is number four with 68 you three guys total in your career with 186 interceptions <laughs> is that awesome is that awesome and oh, and b mac b mac they yes, didn't sir. throw the ball in this day they ran no. the ball off tackle uh Lombardi was, everybody was trying to copy his offense they were winning uh, the championship a lot and they, they ran the ball 65, 67% of the time. They only threw it 33% of the time, man. And, and when they uh, threw it, you guys were picking it off. Hey, if I could have been playing the day where they're throwing it 70% of the time, man, I'd have got me some of those. Hey, I got a story <laughs> for you. Uh, be, yes, sir. You'll get a laugh out of it. Uh, you know how I would always, you guys would be stretching and everything, you know. Uh huh. Yep. I'd walk in around you know, and give you a little, hey, we got to go today, got to have a good practice, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I'd be jack- jacking it up and getting ready to go. That was, it was a good day to be alive. I was ready to go to work. Yes, well, sir. I, I would generally go by and, uh, you know, I, as I would do with you guys, and it never changed. I tried to establish credibility, and I'd say I had 62 picks. How I many you got, you know? And I'd walk <laughs> on down around. So I'm uh, I'm coaching in, in uh, not Pittsburgh, but I'm walking around. It's early. And I said, man, I might have to change this style here a little bit. And I said, hey, I go to man, and I'd keep talking a little bit every now and then about my interceptions, you know. So mm-hmm. this very respectful rookie, he throws his hand up and he's stretching, you know, when I'm going around, I'm jacking around, getting ready for practice. He said, coach, coach, can I ask you a question? And I said, uh, 
yeah, yeah, go go ahead, man. We're all family. Well, what's the question? And he said, well, what did they do? Did they just throw at you all the time, man? Is that how you got those interceptions? All them balls was coming your way. And I said, well, I'll tell you, there is some truth to that. Because I had night training and Lynn Barney on the other side of the field for me. And they sure as heck weren't going to throw at them all day long. So I had my <laughs> opportunity. He was being real respectful. He said, Coach, did they just throw at you all the time? <laughs> Meaning you were the weak leg, you know. I, I said, no, not all the time, because a lot of times it came back at them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you made them pay. You definitely made them pay. Uh, Coach, so when you talk about your playing career and then venturing off into the coaching world, for me, I was extremely lucky. Lucky, I, I was able to get to the championship my rookie year and win it all my rookie year. For you, the wait was 46 years in the NFL. What was it like, Coach, reaching that mountaintop after devoting all that time over the years in the National Football League to try to get that championship as a coach? Uh, it's unexplainable, uh, really, in words. But uh, I thought, you know, uh, Buffalo had those great teams and they went to four straight Super Bowls and they lost all four of them. And uh, I don't think they've been it, back again. And uh, that was prior to us getting to it some. And uh, I had gone twice in Cincinnati and both of them close games and lost. You know, each year that clock ticks. And uh, mm -hmm. I, wasn't, I wasn't a young coach then. And then our first time in Pittsburgh that we got there, we had that game with, with uh, Dallas. And Dallas Cowboys. gained 200, 245 yards in total offense. And I don't know for sure, again, about records, but that's got to be the lowest amount of yards a winner ever ever made in that game. And we lost. So I, now we were, I was on three, man. And we were going up to Detroit to play mm -hmm. in that first game. And that's the one you're smiling about. I know that. <laughs> but but uh, I, I'm all this time is starting to look to me because I was not a young coach uh, even then. Yep. Uh, it looks like I'm going to be one of those guys that gets there every now and then, but coach, have a lucky enough to have a long coaching career, but never win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we they had that last shot down there and, and Ike reached up there and batted that last ball down, and then Ben ran a, a quarterback keeper to kneel the last four plays. And uh, we beat Seattle 20 to 10 was the final yeah. score. Well, everybody flooded the field and the players were going crazy. I walked over to the bench. I sat down on the bench. There was nobody within 50 yards of me. Everybody was, and the confetti was raining down, man. And I was staring, staring at that scoreboard. And it kept saying, Pittsburgh 20. Seattle 10. And I kept saying, man, that's, that's right. That's what it says. <laughs> so this ain't a dream. It ain't gonna, they ain't going to flip that score around and put Seattle up there to 21 or nothing. That's the final score. It's over. But that that's the only thing I really remember from the moment of that game being over. Because most of the time you're calling a game and you, you're, you know, you're, Thoughts are completely focused on what's a game situation, what's the down and distance, who was in the game, who they got in the game, and you're just busy working, working, working. And when it was finally over, I sat down. I, I'm going to tell you, I sat there for a full five minutes and just stared at that scoreboard, and I was so – it was like a zoned out. I was in a completely mm -hmm. uh, different medium, man. I said, we finally did it, and I ain't going to get shut out. <laughs> and then you guys come back and got and got me another one in in the Super Bowl of 08, uh, of 09 in the season yeah. of 08. And that's what that's what the team that the defense that my book's about is coming now because uh, that that 08 defense man they put out some numbers ain't nobody going to come up with again I don't think. Yeah, and let's 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 talk about the defenses right uh, especially when I was there. Uh, which defense would you consider? was the best unit. The 05 defense, as we just talked about, that beat the Seattle Seahawks. The 08 defense, they had a historic year and won the championship. And the 2010 defense, that just was knocking people out almost every week. Uh, they, they were they were all great defenses. You know, I love all, 
I love all my defenses that I got the honor to coach, uh, whether we had a winning record for the season or not, because I would always just ask you guys uh, to give me all you got. And uh, yourself, B-Mac, you right there in the front row of the class for that. Every time I ask you to go do something and do it with all the energy that you had, you did that in uh, in extra and I'll, I'll always be grateful to all of you guys uh, just for the environment that you gave me to coach in and the respect that you gave me. But uh, in terms of picking uh, who was the best, to me, they're all the best. But statistically speaking, man, ain't nobody going to touch that 2008 defense. They just can't. And i tell you what, I've often asked myself, why, why did that particular group uh, listen, you can go down through the statistic categories, uh, fewest points allowed. That's that's the number one stat. That's the only stat they pay off on who won the game. Well, we were first there. But the total yards, they rate on that. We won that. Rushing yards, we we were number one in that. Passing yards, we were number one in that. Pass completion allowed, we were number one in that. Uh Yards gained against the defense on first down. That's a critical stat. You know, you yeah. got to get that offense out of their comfort zone. We were number one in that. Uh, third down success of getting off the field. We were number one in that. I mean, you can go red zone defense. You tell me <laughs> that. We were number one. And I said, well, why, why was this group, you know me, it happened to put up with me for a few years playing for me. Uh, I was always going to let you know where you were statistically. Yes, sir. Was, I, yes, sir. I thought it was I thought it was a good yardstick to compare you strictly to other defenses, because uh, your record as offense, defense, special teams, and and you got to be good in all categories in all areas to be successful. But I wanted something to focus on on my guys where I could say if I had to pound you over the head with something, I would. As you hear something that ain't good enough, and uh, there was nothing there. Uh, but in doing that, I became very tuned in to what other teams' statistics were. And I started looking at that 08 defense. I said, man, I, I did it for 30 years, you know. And I said, I never looked at any kind of numbers like this. We were number one in everything. And I thought to myself, well, someday I'm going to write a book about that bunch of guys. Yeah. Why were they so good? And I'll tell you why I think it was. You, you could all tackle, and you all wanted to tackle. And defense is still always going to be finding the guy with the ball and getting his butt on the ground. And every yeah. one of you guys would – it was like kicking a beehive, man. You When that ball was snapped, you was after that ball, and you did not miss tackles. We mm -hmm. also led another key statistic in big plays allowed – for six straight years. And that was a, just a, a, what an honor and a, a blessing really to get a coach, you guys. And uh, there was never a discipline problem, uh, never a, a conditioning problem. Uh, you were just a special bunch of guys. And I'm, I said, I'm going to write a book about them someday. And I did. <laughs> yeah. I so what's the name, what's the name of the book? Coach? You ain't got no time. Go ahead. Oh, what, what's Go the, ahead. the title of the book? I thought about that a long while, and I tell you when when I hit it up, I, I was I looked at every game we played, uh, and looked at some of the television, uh, 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 re, uh, you know, disc coming back on them. Uh, I watched the whole game, and uh, there was a sound bite from Mike talking to you guys uh, in the uh, Super Bowl game in uh, against Arizona. Yep. And Ben hit Santonio down in that corner with that unbelievable pass catch to take take that lead after we'd lost it in the fourth quarter. It was a hit the whole game. And uh, when they scored, there was still uh, about a minute to go in the game, but we had to get off the field. And Mike had you guys around him, and, and uh, he said, you guys have done a great job. You got all these great numbers, he said. But if you go out here in this particular possession and you stop these guys right now, you will become a legendary defense. That was yep, Mike's words that. right there. Yep. And I said to myself, ooh, there's a title for my book. 
a, a <laughs> legendary defense, and that's that's what it's called, a legendary, legendary defense. defense. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I don't know whether I got to pay Mike royalties for that or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and another stat that's not necessarily a, a, a stat, but that season we had the toughest schedule in the National Football League. I think that's a key stat. A yes. key stat. The one, yeah. Based on the one loss record of the guys going into it, uh, it was the toughest the toughest one, the most difficult season. And they only, I think we gave up, I don't know, 230 yards a game or something like that. That was when yeah. I played and everybody ran the ball, we would give up 250 yards a, a game. And that was unheard of stats. Yeah. And you guys were 230 something, man. Oh yeah. We, we, we held 13 straight opponents to under 300 yards. Never been done before. 13 straight got offenses we faced didn't get 300 yards total offense. Well, it went all the way uh, to till the uh, Tennessee game before a single runner had ever gotten to 100 yeah. yards. Off. Yeah, Chris Johnson. Chris Johnson yeah. broke out on us. It, 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 you told us to be gaps out. Like, <laughs> I think that was a good uh, a good thing to happen to us and that losing that game down there because we were really rolling uh -huh. and I'm not going to say we were getting a little full of ourselves, but that helped tap us back into reality. Said, hey, somebody, somebody's out there every week, and, and yep. they ain't going to lay over and, and let you roll. And and Tennessee had a great team, and uh, we beat Baltimore three times that year, and Baltimore beat them in the playoffs. Yep. And then we had to play them in, in the championship game, in a great game. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great memories. But yes, that 08 defense for our listeners and viewers, man, you heard what coach gave you in, in regards to the numbers, but go look it up yourself. That's a, that was a, as he stated, his the title of his book, a legendary defense, hopefully will be dropping in 2024 upon completion from the great Dick LeBeau. Make sure you go out and support coach LeBeau. There's a lot of contributions you've been able to give to the game of football. But one thing that I always look at you in regards to the contributions quote unquote the fire zone concepts and i remember i can't remember what year it was it could have been 05 04 06 or 07 but as you talk about the stretch line you know you walk around and you give us little uh uh, uh phrases of of encouragement or just kind of joke around with us and i was like i wanted to ask coach lebeau because i consider myself to be a historian in the game i said coach why everybody want to give you like the, the fire zone creator? Like, where did that come up from? And I remember, I don't know if you were joking or if you were serious. You were like, well, B Mac, I'm out playing a ball game with the Detroit Lions. I'm on one side and, and night train is over there with me. And we had two wide receivers removed. We were in a cover two. You said train looked at me and say, Dickie, I'm gone. I'm blitzing. And he was like, Train, you, what you mean you're blitzing? We got two receivers in the zone. <laughs> How am I going to cover both? And you and you said, Train, say, cover both of them. I'm blitzing. And that's what's kind of the concepts of the fire zone. I don't know if you remember that uh, that conversation we had, but how legit is that? And is that where you actually kind of came up with the fire zone concepts where you're basically playing man zone along with bringing unexpected pressure? Well, I was looking for a safer way to blitz is, is where it came from. And the story is correct, but you, your facts are a little bit off. The one ain't cover two when I start, first started playing with night trade, but we played a lot of zone, but we played okay. mostly many. But what happened was, and I, I'll tell you, this is, we're going back in, in time here. There was only 31 players on a team, man. So there was five DBs and, uh, they didn't have quite as many formations of cover because they only covered three, carry three, maybe four wide receivers. So you didn't have five wide receivers spread out somewhere because they didn't have them on a team. Well, somebody on the in the secondary had to learn all the positions because if one guy got hurt, you could substitute there. But yep. if you were down to four DBs, five is all they carried. Five DBs was all uh, was on the squad, and uh, if if uh, one guy got hurt. One guy, I was the guy. I learned how to play both safeties in the other corner. Of course, the other corner was just a reverse side of the field from what I was playing. But uh, we had the left safety go down in a game, and I was playing left safety. 
and because that was it. When one guy knew my position, then I went to the other guy who was hurt wherever he was, and I just played that spot for the rest of the game. So I was over there on the left side with nitrate, and uh, we come out. I don't go up for a while, and like I told you, man, the quarterbacks feared nitrate. Man, you didn't know what he was going to do, and they they didn't either. And uh, train, we're going back to the huddle, and nitrate says, "Hey, Dick." Diggy Bird's what he called me. He said, Diggy Bird, he said, quarterback ain't even looking over here. He said, I'm going to blitz. And he said, watch my guy for me. I said, well, hold, hold on here, Night Train. Uh, I can't be watching your guy. I, my report here says I got to tie it in, man. I got a guy of my own to watch. He said, watch them both, Diggy Bird. He said, he ain't looking over here. I'm going to get him before he can throw it to my guy anyhow. <laughs> and he blitzed and sacked the guy. And I, that was part of the uh, thing of uh, of uh, what I would call surprise pressure. That, mm-hmm. that I, But all how many incidents like that in playing for 14 years that added to, to my philosophical uh, thoughts on defense – but again, for the final uh, thing, that uh, really starting to tinker around with zone concepts in behind pressure uh, was all the study that I did on stats. And I, I broke down every defense and every play that we ran and the yards gained per th- run and the yards gained per pass against it. And traditionally, over the years, pressure defenses had the best numbers uh, particularly in interceptions, turnover, sacks, things like that. And I said, man, those are the those are the plays that can win for defenses and help contribute to the win for the football team. But along with it, they generally speaking gave up the biggest plays because if somebody fell down, slipped, missed a tackle, it was out the gate for a 50, 60 yard play. And I said, well, what if you could just get a lot of pressure on the dudes and still have a, a, a guy or two that didn't have an assignment where he had to go running all over, chasing the guy all over the field, but get to an area? And that's what started it, basically. So you're kind of kind of right on your BMAC, and you are a historian <laughs> of the game because that's a long time ago, man. Oh, I, I remember because fire zones are something that we ran at Florida State before I was coached by you. And I always wanted to know where this concept came from. And I kept hearing the great Dick LeBeau is the, the father of the fire zone. And as I look to my right right now, one of our infamous fire zones that we used to run, you gave us this, this poster of the Sam fire zone concept that we oftentimes ran with the nickel, with the shade with blitz. You know, you run a, a, a stunt with the shade coming in as a contained player. James Harrison would be the, I'm sorry, James Harris would be the upfield blitz. So the shade would come right off his butt. And that fire zone was something that we ran a lot out of our nickel package. And I remember, I can't remember what year it was, but it says Dick LeBeau, 1988. I think that's when you created the Sam fire zone concept that defenses are running to this day still on every level. So clearly you need to have your flowers given to you because you created something, a concept that is ran throughout football, high school, heck, even maybe Pop Warner defenses are trying to run some of this fire zone concepts and you were the mastermind and i'll tell you this for our listeners and our viewers coach lebeau playbook in regards to pressures oh my goodness it was it was a thing of beauty if you really love football and dialing up some nice plays coach lebeau was the mastermind in doing so and i'll say this too coach when you talk about our time when we were together the two biggest threats in the afc during our time was the patriots and the Colts. And both teams had unbelievable quarterbacks. But what were the differences in game planning for those two teams featuring Tom Brady and Peyton Manning? Well, uh, and you usually would look at the offensive statistics going into a game, and you knew when you're going to have your hands extra full. And uh, the teams that you watch that reach the playoffs now and reach the championship, and when you look at the, at the heart and soul of them, there's a heck of a really good quarterback in there. And mm-hmm. those two guys, uh, for sure, uh, were two of the major reasons that those 10 teams won a ton of championships. And uh, uh, as far as preparation, I would always try to try to see what their uh, 
uh, protections were. And the, the important thing to me was uh, I didn't care what they were doing when they were 10 points ahead or 20 points ahead. I, I wanted to try to figure out if I could, when they were, when their back was against the wall and they had to have a play and most people in the whole stadium and on both sides of the field knew they were going to throw the ball. What were you going to get? What protection were you going to get? And when, when you could identify what they had the most confidence in, then I would start looking at how did I tear that house down? And that was the protection that I wanted to beat. And if I, if I had a fire zone I thought would beat it, I wouldn't run it until a situation got up when I thought in my mind, hey, these guys ain't playing around now. They got to have it. And I'm going to try to, you know, put put what I designed against it. And I'll tell you something. There was a lot of thought that went into all that. And sometimes it would work and sometimes it didn't. But one of the things in coaching, when you had the responsibility of calling every snap, calling every defense, you're going to err. Uh, you're in, invariably going to err at some point in time because nobody calls the right defense that works right all the time. If they did, nobody would ever lose because the, the coach would always have the best defense and you'd win. And I, you can't believe, you can believe, because you've been in games where a play or two that you made or didn't make was, uh, in the end, one of the differences in the game. And you can't, you can't sleep at night. You can't, you mm-hmm. can, you don't rest literally until you can get back on the field the next Sunday and answer that. And, and when you're calling the play and you're the coach, you have the same response if you care. And a coach should care as much as the players. And I've always been uh, one of my strongest beliefs. And I would have nights that were very, pretty tough every night that I know that I messed up and put my guys in a spot that, that hurt them instead of help them. You dare to help them. And what I what I learned to and part of my longevity uh I had uh, every reason in the world to call that defense at that time. I'd mm-hmm. given my thought, I'd put in my due process, and I'd studied the film, and I thought it was the best thing to do at that time. And when it blew up, it blew up, man. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I just I shook up one of those magic eight balls and come up with, oh, well, let's call this, let's try that. So that was of my process in in running the game, calling the defense, and. Uh, uh, I, I would try to match up our best guys against their best guys and call the play that I thought would win at the most important part of the defense. I wish I'd been right more often, but I was right a few times. No question. Yes, sir. You're right. More than more than not being right. Let's say that. Coach, we had an opportunity. Uh, I had an opportunity of talking to uh, Troy Palomalu a few weeks ago, and you were obviously his Hall of Fame presenter, you know, on what in regards to Troy playing under you, what allowed Troy to seemingly play with so much freedom in your defense? Well, Troy is one of the most instinctive players that I've ever seen. And, and I, I think that was very uh, obvious to anyone who watched him play, whether you were on the field with him, against him, or just in the stands watching him. And I realized that he, he just had innate, uh, ability to sense uh, and diagnose formation uh, plays from uh, everybody studies film. All players, all coaches study film. And the ones that, that usually uh, stand out are the ones that can uh, convert that uh, data into actual physical reaction to what they're seeing as the game unfolds. And, and uh, Troy was phenomenal at, oh, here comes this, and I'm going to get there before they do. And (laughs) Troy had another big plus being back. He had Ryan Clark playing safety back there beside him. And he Mm -hmm. and Ryan were as close uh, as any two players I've ever seen, and they studied together. And I don't know, I watched them day in and day out, game in and game out. I don't know how they communicated sometimes. I think they did it telepathically because I never <laughs> saw them talking that much. But Troy would just kind of look look over there like that at him, and, and Ryan would look back like this, 
and Troy would take off and Ryan would have him backed up perfect. So if Roy, uh, if Troy messed up, which occasionally he did, we know that there would be Ryan Clark right there. And that's why we gave up the fewest amount of big plays because yeah. Ryan was always rolling around in behind Troy. But, but the combination of that, they gave us the best two safeties in the league for a lot of years, made me a smart coach. Yeah. Is there a specific Troy moment that stands out above the rest for you? For me? Yes. Do you remember when he intercepted that ball in the end zone? We had the game one, and he took off running with it in the late in the fourth quarter. And the only thing that could possibly bad happen to us, uh, that could happen to us, would be if he ran it out there and fumbled it, and then they got the ball back and got a first down. And you know how much I preach to you guys about, hey, running's great, but when it's when you got the game one, just get on the ground. Mm-hmm. Well, that Troy took off on that, and not only did he run it, he threw a lateral back over his shoulder. You remember that game? <laughs> well, maybe you don't, but I do. So when he came off the field, you guys know that I didn't, I didn't ever holler at you at all. Never hollered at all, never. And and I just felt like if I ever did, which occasionally I did, that you guys would at least hear me because you knew it was different if I was hollering. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I would on occasion, uh, so I went to Troy and I said, Troy, you can't do that. I said, this is a family. You put all your family members at, at risk out there throwing that damn ball around when we got the game one. And mm-hmm. Troy walked away and uh, he was gone about 45 to 50 seconds. And I looked around and here he come back and I, there's a picture of him and I, I'm, I'm hugging him, you know. And he got mm-hmm. his he got his head down, and uh, that's my favorite Troy Palomalo mo- uh, moment, it, because he was he was such a leader and such such a charismatic player, and yet no one cared anymore or felt any worse if he did anything at all yeah. that really wasn't in in the most extreme team concept, and. Uh, uh, I didn't want to do it, but that's just part of coaching. Uh, all your kids, uh, you got to keep them, uh, treat them all the same way. And yeah. uh, but I, I got that picture of me and Troy, and uh, of course the picture don't say everything that I just said. And uh, that's my favorite favorite moment with Troy. Yeah. Oh man, great great moment. We 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 had a lot of moments, but that's a, a unique answer when you talk about everything that he's done that were celebrating like celebratory like plays and you talk about the one instance when he had a lateral because we used to always try to lateral the ball anyway you the coaches used to hate that matter of fact that was something that we oftentimes tried to do uh coach when you talk about some of the traditions that we had together how did reading how did the reading of the night before christmas became become such a holiday tradition a tradition for the steelers well, I I grew up in uh, World War II. Really, it was uh, I was born in thirty seven and, and uh, forty one is when the war started, and uh, it wasn't over till forty five. So I remembered uh, those t- those days. Those uh, things were rationed. Uh, we couldn't get shoes. We couldn't get milk. Everything went to the troops overseas, and rightly mm-hmm. so. Uh, but. Uh, I was a small town, London, Ohio, and, and really nobody had anything. And everything went to the war effort pretty much. And uh, uh, I, I wouldn't, I guess we were poor, but we didn't know it because everybody had the same thing throughout the whole the whole town. But except Christmas, uh, my, my family, my dad had three sisters and my mom, and the women were uh, very... Uh, Christmas orientated and they made it such a special time of the year. And uh, yes, the birthday of Christ was, was always number one, but the rest was family uh, and the, the values and the uh, the things in life that, that really matter. And that's your family and, and your surrounding people. And uh, I, I, it hit me. I mean, I, I thought, man, this is the greatest thing in, in the world. And what can I do to tell these women, to show these women 
that I got it now. I got the Christmas spirit, and I understand what it all is about, but loving your brother, loving your fellow man. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll learn the night before Christmas and, and learn how to recite it. Well, that was before I knew how many verses there were in it. <laughs> it's longer <laughs> than you think. So I started to work on it, but it took me a while because you, I, I had other things to do. I would say it was by Christmas time when it would really move me to, to memorize the whole thing. And yep. it took me a couple of years. But once I did it, I did it for my family. And then once I, I did that, uh, it was a hit with my family. And I thought, well, you know, my, my teammates, my, my players that I'm coaching, they're my family. I'm going to do it for them. So I just started doing it for the defense. And uh, pretty soon the head coach said, well, I heard you recited the night before Christmas to the defense. And I said, yeah. I, I, and I told him pretty much the story I just told you. Yep. And he said, well, why didn't you do it for the whole team? I said, well, I ain't the head coach. <laughs> I said, that ain't my call. He said, well, I want you to do it for the whole team. And that's how we started uh, doing it for the whole team. Uh, that's something that we look forward to every year, by the way. Uh, you know, when we get close to Christmas time, we already know Coach LeBeau is going to be a Saturday night before we go to battle on Sunday. He's going to get up and recite the night before Christmas and a full round of applause from the entire room. So we appreciate that, Coach. Coach, before we let you go, I want to transition let me to the... Say one, let me say one thing, B-Mac. What you got? We almost never, we almost never lost on that Christmas game. You're right. We lose You're right. Every now, but we almost never lost. Almost. We're we're, we're like in a ninety percentile in regards to percentages hey, of winning. It. You got yes, it. You yes. got it. So before I let you go, Coach, I want to transition to the superlative part of our show. I'm gonna hit you with a few rapid fire questions. I want your honest, unbiased answer. Right. So first question for you: toughest quarterback to game plan for was who? I love you, Tough you back on your team match, and I'm so thankful for everything that you have done for me in my life. And I love you, B-Mac, and all your teammates. I appreciate it, Coach. <laughs> That's I don't give a damn about what quarterback we're we'll playing. <laughs> we're going to give him a hard time. I love it. Hey, Coach, you kind of confused me for a second. I'm like, did he not hear the question? But that's it. That's your answer. I know. That's your answer. I know I had you. I know I had you. Yes, sir. Okay. Favorite team to coach against? Cincinnati Bengals. Cincinnati. Okay. Player you never got to coach, but you would have loved to have an opportunity to coach him. I, I, I really don't have one. And I think it would be so superfluous for me to, to name a player that I wish I could have coached. First of all, I played with the great Night Train Lane, who is certainly the greatest character that ever played football. Mm -hmm. I, I played with Lem Barney, who was, in my opinion, the most skilled athletic corner man that there ever will be. Wow. But beyond that, I coached Rod Woodson. Mm. I coached Carnell Lake. I coached Troy Palomalo. I coached James Harrison. I mean, if I start <laughs> naming them, man, we're going to be here forever. So I got no player, no player that I, I could have coached. And I'm so grateful for where I have been and what I was allowed to do. Okay. I got a better one for you then. Which Steeler player that you had the opportunity of coaching surprised you the most with their career? James Harrison. Yeah, I think that I think the consensus would be Debo. Well, uh, I didn't know I didn't know James when when I went back. I came. I'd been with uh, Pittsburgh and and was gone, and then got lucky enough to get back. Mm -hmm. And that year that I came back, before we went into training camp, uh, we were uh, short a linebacker. We needed a linebacker, and and. Uh, they said, well, what about Harrison? And uh, I said, I don't know. You have to ask Coach Butler. He He's coached him. I don't I don't know him. Mm -hmm. and Coach Butler, I said, does he have a chance to make a team and help us? That's I mean, ain't no sense bringing somebody in that can't help us mm -hmm. or at least have a good chance to help us. And Butler said, yeah, I think he's got a good chance to help somebody. I said, well, then bring him in. 
And uh, that's all I knew about him. I, but I did know that I think he'd been released from five different NFL rosters. And he had yep. been failed five times. And we got on the practice field. And I was watching number 92. You know, I watched everybody. I watched all the drills. And every night before I go to bed, I would look at everything every player did. And I said, nobody's blocking this 92. I said, who is this guy? And uh, next day, same thing. And I said, Coach Butler, I said, who's this 92? He said, well, that's the James Harrison that, that we talked about. I said, that, that's Harrison? He said, yeah. I said, he's pretty good. I said, uh, let's make sure that we get him plenty of reps and, and plenty of plays when we get into these preseason games because I ain't seen anybody block him yet. And you know something? I still haven't seen anybody <laughs> block him, and that's 30 years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, he just fell to me. Uh, and I'm always very quick and proud to say I was never on any of those staffs that turned Harrison loose and cut him because <laughs> I would have never let that guy go, man. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. Uh, that's why I would say that he he exceeded anybody's expectations with, with what he accomplished, uh, and I hope someday he's in the Hall of Fame. I think I think when it's all said and done, I think he will get into the Hall of Fame, Coach. And you know the crazy part about our 05 team. All right, let's let's highlight the people who are already in the Hall: yourself, Bill Cower, Mr. Rooney, Jerome Bettis. Alan Fanica, Troy Palomalo. We have six members from that 05 team, Suvo team, that's already in the Hall of Fame. That's six. And I, I don't know if I'm missing somebody or, 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 or no, not. I don't think you are. I don't but think that's, it's, it's six already. It's not like that 05 Super Bowl happened 30 or 40 years ago, right? That was 05. You know what I mean? So to have six members already in the Hall, and you talk about James Harrison, eventually he get in. Ben is going to get in. That would be eight. Eventually, I believe Heinz Ward should get in. That would be nine. I, I mean, you talk doubt. about no doubt. Think about how how prolific that is for us to already have how six members our, in. And how and about our tight end? He he, he probably get in. He probably that could be ten. That could be ten, Coach. That 05 championship team doesn't get talked about enough in regards to what we were able to do, what we had to do, and then the legendary people that were a part of that team, either as coaches or players that are already in the Hall of Fame. So we have six already in the Hall, followed by another potential four. Well, Think before you kick me out of here, let me tell people one story about you, my friend. That <laughs> I'll, always remember. I'll always remember. In that uh, playoff game against Indianapolis, mm -hmm. you were a very young, young player. And you always, as a coach, you always kind of, Watch your young players pretty closely, and particularly young corners, because you know that the other team is going to check them out pretty good. And when uh, Bettis fumbled that ball on the two-yard line, we all thought the game was over. Yes, we did. And we had to go out again. We stopped them a pretty dig on good all day. But we now we had to keep Pete Manning those guys three points of what they needed to tie the game up. Yeah. And they had a ball around midfield. And I thought, man, we got to stop it one more time. I said, I know, I know B Max going to have some work. You made three <laughs> plays. You made three plays in that drive, P Max. And from that day on, I never worried another second about how you were going to hold up when the chips got on the table. You knocked the ball down three times and almost intercepted one of uh -huh. them. I know you remember. I just <laughs> yep. want you to know the old coach is not forgotten. And I want a few of these people that weren't even in the football when that happened. Uh, you were part of uh, the that team. That's another thing about that 08 team. They had the most depth. Mm -hmm. And we had injuries at every level uh, for extended periods of time. But the next guy that went in there just did as good a job. But that yep. game against Peyton Manning in Indianapolis in the playoffs, I'll always remember you, my man. I appreciate it, Coach. I just didn't want to let you guys down. That's all. I just wanted to fight till the end. 
and not be the reason why we're not able to get that fifth Super Bowl that led to the sixth Super Bowl. I hear you, pal. I hear you. I appreciate it. Co- Coach, I, man, listen, man, it's a pleasure for you to be able to join me here. Before I let you go, Coach, the book. Tell us about the book. When should we expect to see the book? You said Legendary Defense is the name. What's up? Fill us in on your book. I don't know anything about those publishing deadlines and things like that, but our end of it is almost finished. Yep. And uh, I think it, I think it's not going to make it for this season, but I think certainly for the next one. 2024 uh, is, is, your, is what you're yeah. thinking. That's that's what I think the the printers are focusing on. So uh, it's it's going to be worth the wait. I guarantee you that it's going to be a great book. I think. Oh yeah, I can't I can't wait. I can't I cannot wait to see exactly what you put together and just also to the memories that will be brought back to life based on what happened in that magnificent story run from that. And I think that OE defense is one of the best defenses to ever do it in the National Football League based on the numbers and the consistency and just how dominant we was. And of course the offenses and the quarterbacks we played against and still standing up to the test. I think, I mean, I put my hat with that numbers, defense. The numbers, numbers our numbers right are better for everybody. Yeah. Coach, our numbers are just as good as some of the, the, the story filled defenses in the history of the game. Number wise. Well, I know where they are. I know where they rate in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But hey, Coach Lobo, thank you for joining me. Pro Football Hall of Famer as a player, two-time Super Bowl champion as a coach, spent parts of seven decades in the National Football League and also a very, very good golfer, by the way. So if you have a good golf course somewhere near uh, a Cincinnati area, you would love to have Coach Lobo be a part of your golf experience, man. He loves to come out and dominate. And, 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 and he's a great storyteller as well. A great storyteller, Coach. I, Coach, I, I, I appreciate you for everything that you were able to do for me in my career on and off the football field. It's always a pleasure still being there, being able to have a relationship with you. Uh, to this day, means a lot to me, and that just tell you tells all of our listeners and our viewers what type of family oriented atmosphere we had in Pittsburgh. Something that would never be replaced. Love you, B Mac. I love you too, Coach. Take care. And in a great words of Dick LeBeau, adios. Adios, baby.